are thrilled that you've joined us tonight and hope you'll stay with us for the next hour and a half. Scott and I are very happy to be here tonight. Amen. Aren't we? Praise God. <laughs> We're looking forward to being able to share with you. We have a lot of music. We have a lot of the word to share tonight. And so I hope that you'll just get comfortable and stay with us. Our prayer partners are here too. And so you can give them a call. You can call the number on your screen. And if you have a prayer request, if you have a praise report, if you have a comment or whatever, you can call and give that to them. And they'll pass it along to us too. If you need somebody to pray with you tonight, they'll be happy to do that. It's just a good thing sometimes when we have somebody to pray with. And we know that we're agreeing together in prayer. So they'll do that also. And if you say, oh, I don't want to call in, you can go online. That's, that's permissible too. You can go online to WGGS16.com and click on prayer and type in your request or your comment or whatever you have. You know, God is so good to us and he has given us so many things. And although we know that, there are times that we find ourselves kind of you know, a little estranged, but we don't have to stay that way. We can begin to ask God, Lord, lift me up. Lord, just show me where I need to be and help me to come back up. And we want to start the program off with that song, Lord, lift me. ever soared into heights with the Lord and then one day your feet are on the ground you may say oh it was grand for the little time we spent but the Lord had so much rather hear you say
uh, do you want to fly tonight? I do. I want to soar and I want to fly with Jesus Christ. It says we are seated together with Him in heavenly places. And you must have to fly to be able to do that. Amen. <laughs> Scott's going to read our scripture for us this evening. Amen. Our scripture comes from Exodus 32, 13. It says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your descendants, your seed, as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And again in Galatians 3.29 it says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. We are the seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ. Amen. When God created the world, He placed seed in all living things. All living things have seed in them, plants and animals, so we would perpetuate. For example, God created apple trees. Apple trees produce apples. Apples have seeds in them. Those seeds produce more trees that produce more apples and more <laughs> seeds. And so you can see that it perpetuates. God also told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And the human race has carried on from generation to generation for thousands of years. A seed is the essential element of transmitting life. It is the source of anything. And God has given us life. Through the seed of His Spirit, He is our source of life. When we receive God's Word, we receive God's Spirit inside of us. We receive the seed of spiritual life. And we are to keep multiplying. We are supposed to keep on multiplying. In the Old Testament, we see um, a physical seed. Through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel was born, and they are God's chosen people through whom the Messiah would come, and we know that He has come. So Satan tries to annihilate God's seed. He's done it all down through time. In the New Testament, we see spiritual seed through Jesus Christ. And that says we are born again. We have the Spirit of God, the Word of God inside of us. So we have that spiritual seed. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to bear fruit. And when we bear fruit, that fruit has seed in it. And that seed can be scattered to produce more. We are to perpetuate the seed of God in this earth. And that's what I want us to talk about some tonight. We are to let those seeds grow and bear that fruit so they can be scattered in those hearts. And Satan tries to annihilate the spiritual seed too. We're made to multiply. We're to spread the seed in the hearts of every person who's around us. And that's how we promote the growth of God's seed in the earth. Are we fulfilling our purpose? Sometimes we think, well, how are we supposed to do that? It sounds overwhelming, but it's really quite simple. During our time together tonight, we're going to be sharing a simple version of fulfilling our purpose to save God's seed in the earth. And it's found in the scripture. The scripture that I'm going to be using is Micah 6, 8. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Those are the three things that God requires of us. And we're going to look at examples of how that works out in our lives. If you give me the theory of something, I'm probably not going to get it. But if you show me examples, you t show me how to do it, I can get it a lot better. So I want us to look at examples of how that this seed is going to be scattered and preserved through us. And so stay with us. We're going to get started on that in just a few minutes. And I'm excited about it to be able to share this teaching with you. But first, Scott's going to be singing a song for us.
That's what we were speaking of. If you are Christ's seed, then you are heirs. And Jesus came that we could be healed, that we could be saved, that we could be set free. But he also said once we do that, that we need to take this healing to the nations. Don't, don't hold it, but take it out. He says, go into all the world and, spree- and preach the gospel. <clears throat> Amen. So take his healing out and show it. Shine forth unto, the, unto this world God's healing power. Because he said he would use us if we're available to him. Be available to him. Take his healing to the nations. I hear a young child crying And see tears of unending pain I've watched this war-torn nation Treated life with such disdain And my heart grieves to know That these haven't come to understand That I suffered for their sufferings And died that they might live again So take my healing to the nations Bind their broken hearts with love. Stretch my hand throughout creation with this message of my love that I came to bring light in their darkness and bring joy where there once was pain. Take my healing to the nation. Bind their broken hearts with love. Well, the fields are ready for harvest, and the laborers there so few. Countless millions still that I want to feel. But the task isn't mine to do. I gave them my commandment. Go and preach glad tidings of joy. That I finished the work on Calvary. And their healing's already been done. So take my healing to the nation. Bind their broken hearts with love. Stretch my hand throughout creation with this message of my love that I came to bring light in their darkness and bring joy where there once was pain. Take my healing to the nation. Bind their broken hearts with love. So take his healing to the nations. Bind their hearts with love stretch his hand throughout creation with this message of his love that he came to bring light in their darkness and bring joy where there once was pain take his healing to the nations take his healing to the nations Take his healing to the nations with love. 
when we take his healing to the nations, we are spreading the seed of God's spirit throughout the world. And that's what he wants us to do. The first thing mentioned that God requires of us to do is to do justly. And you say, well, how do we do justly? It simply means do what's right. Do the right thing. And that's, that's what God tells us to do. Now, here's an example of that. And Esther is the perfect example of doing what's right. Esther was an ordinary Jewish girl. Uh, her parents had died and she was raised by her cousin, Mordecai. And Mordecai was more like a father to her than he was a cousin. And Mordecai also was one of the Jews who had been taken captive from Jerusalem and brought into Babylon. And he served in the king's palace in Shushan. The king of Babylon had a party one day and he decided he wanted his queen Vashti to come in and show everybody how beautiful she was. But Queen Vashti had different ideas than the king did and she told him, no, I won't come. That's not a good thing to tell a king, especially when he's your husband too. But she refused. And so he dethroned her for insubordination. And then he was totally without a queen. So they needed to find a new queen. And somebody came up with this beauty contest of sorts so that they could find the most graceful, the most beautiful woman in the kingdom to take the place of Queen Vashti. So when this contest was over, Esther, this little Jewish slave girl who had been brought from, from Jerusalem as a slave, she was the new queen of Babylon. But now Mordecai had told her, he said, don't tell anybody you're Jewish. So nobody else knew. And she obeyed what he told her. She knew he had wisdom and she, she paid attention to what he said. After Esther had been queen for a while, uh, Mordecai was told about an evil plot to kill all the Jews in the provinces there in Babylon. And it was a plot to destroy God's seed in the earth. That's what it was really all about. So Mordecai sent word to Esther. And he said, Esther, you need to speak to the king. After all, you are the queen. That makes perfect sense. But there was one problem. There was this law that forbade anybody from just approaching the king unless he had called for them to come into his presence. And that included the queen. And not only were they forbidden, but if they went ahead and did it anyway, anyone who came on their own could be killed unless the king held out the golden scepter to them. And that would probably depend on what kind of mood he was in. That's my guess. Esther had not been summoned in to see the king for 30 days. And she was in a position to help her people, but it was going to put her life at risk. He had already dethroned one. What would he do if, if she came into his presence without him asking? She sent that word to Mordecai. And I want you to listen to what Mordecai answered. He says, if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther was in a place of honor. God had miraculously put her there. She didn't ask to be queen of Babylon. God had done that. Why? Should she give all that up, the blessing of God on her? Why should she give that up? Mordecai's answer was wise. He answered that question probably just in case she was thinking it. How do you know God didn't put you right where you are right at this time so you could make a difference and save God's people? 
Well, Esther had a choice to make. She had influence and she could probably stop the massacre. After all, she wasn't the only one at risk. All the Jews in all the provinces were at risk. So after fasting and after praying, Esther chose to do justly. She chose to do the right thing. She had no promise of a good outcome. Now, we know how it turns out, but she didn't. She approached the king. She went in to the king, and the king accepted her. He held out the golden scepter to her and accepted her. Not only that, the king heard her. He listened to what she said, and he turned the plot to where Esther's people were saved. Because she did the right thing, she accomplished God's person, and she saved God's seed in the earth. She was at the right place at the right time by God's design. She didn't do it. She had nothing to do with being there. God did it, and she made the right choice. My question is, would we do the right thing even at great personal cost? Would we do it? This is our way to save God's seed in the earth, by the way. But a better question is probably this. Do we do the right thing even though we know it's going to cost us? Esther didn't plan her circumstances. God did. And God will plan yours too. She simply chose to do what was right in her circumstances. And God is saying, that's what I want you to do. Every day, I want you just to choose what's right every day. Do we choose what's right on a daily basis? In the workplace, do we just kind of slide into unethical business principles? It's easy to do. Everybody else is doing it. Or do we refuse to compromise God's principles, even if it's going to cost us something? Do we live by a godly standard at home? You may say, oh, well, I'm at home. It doesn't matter what I do. Yes, you are who you are at home. And what is your default mode when you're alone? That's who you are. In relationships, do we treat people fairly? Do we walk in love? Are we doing the right thing? Are we sowing the right seeds in people's lives? By the Spirit of God in us, we can plant the seed of His Word in every situation that we encounter, or we can choose the easy way out. Esther decided she was going to plant the seeds. She was going to do what was right. We have to realize people are watching us. People are looking to us. If we say, I'm a Christian, they're saying, are they really? Because people have in their mind what they think a Christian should and shouldn't do. So does God. So Jesus said the same thing that Mordecai said about this. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Sounds like what Mordecai said, didn't it? It sounds like what Mordecai said. Whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. When you're in a position to choose the right thing or the safe thing, take my advice, choose the right thing because the right thing is the safe thing. The right thing is definitely the safe thing. When we're in the will of God, we are in the safest place we can possibly be. Even if we're like Esther and we've stepped into a place where it seems that, oh, wow, this is going to come caving in on me. I may lose my life. Even if it looks like that, we know that we're in a safe place in the will of God. It may seem that if we release everything into God's hands that we're going to be crushed. That's not the case. It will actually set us free. So we need to choose to do what's right, to do justly in every area of our life. We need to choose to do justly.
And I hope that we can take this, this example of Esther and say, you know, Esther did it and God took care of her. I know he'll take care of me. And that we can take courage and move into the places where God would have us be. Let him put us there by his design, not our own. And then say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Scott is going to sing another song for us right now. Praise the Lord. Are your things, are your riches here on earth? Or are your riches in heaven? Jesus spoke to his disciples and he speaks to us today. He says, lay not up treasures here on earth where rust and moth corrupt, but lay up your treasures in heaven where, broth, where moth and rust don't corrupt. And when we do that, when we begin to, to be heavenly minded and to seek the things that are above, we find that the things that are here in our lives, we begin to leave them behind and we begin to follow Christ and his teachings. We'll find that our treasures are more than abundantly above what we can even ask or think. Things we leave behind. There sits Simon, so foolishly wise, proudly he's tending his nets. Then Jesus calls, and the boats drift away, and all that he owns he forgets. But more than the nets he abandoned that day, he found that his pride was soon drifting away, and it's hard to imagine. The freedom we find from the things we leave behind. Matthew was mindful of taking the tax and pressing the people to pay. But hearing the truth, he responded in faith and turned toward the light and the way. And leaving the people so puzzled he found The greed in his heart was no longer around And it's hard to imagine the freedom we find From the things we leave behind Every heart needs to be set free From possessions that hold it so tight Cause freedom's not found in the things that we own But it's the power to do what is right With Jesus our only possession Then giving becomes our delight Cause we can't imagine the freedom we find From the things we leave behind share the love for the world in our lives by worshiping goods we possess when jesus says lay all your treasures aside and love god above all the rest because when we say no to the things of the world we open our hearts to the love of the lord and it's hard to imagine the freedom we find from the things we leave behind. Cause when we say no to the things of the world, we open our hearts to the love of the Lord. And it's hard to imagine the freedom we find from the things we leave behind. And it's hard to imagine the freedom we find. From the things we leave behind From the things we leave behind
sometimes the things we leave behind will set us free. So with some things we just need to leave behind. And I think Esther was ready. She said, okay, you know, if I perish, I perish. But she didn't. But to know that we can have the courage to walk forward. The second thing that God requires of us is to love mercy. That simply means choose to heal rather than injure. Choose to heal rather than injure. We're to love mercy. And I can't think of a better example of that in the Old Testament than Joseph. He's a wonderful example of loving mercy. Joseph was chosen by God. He was favored by his father. He was the second to the youngest of 12 brothers, and his brothers hated him he, because he was favored by his father. But he also had dreams that God had given him about them bowing down to him. Um, he told them about those dreams, and they hated him, and they mistreated him. And finally, they sold him into slavery. But you know what? That was better than their first plan because some of them wanted to kill him. But one brother said, wait a minute, no, no, we can't do that. So they sold him into slavery. Joseph wound up in Egypt, of all places, as a slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was the captain of the guard of Egypt. He was an important man. And Joseph was put over his whole household. He was over the whole thing because he proved to be a man of excellence and a man of integrity. But there was somebody else in the household of Potiphar that had no integrity whatsoever, and that was Potiphar's wife. Daily she tried to seduce Joseph, and daily he refused her. And so she falsely accused him, and he was put in prison. But wherever Joseph was, he did everything with excellence. Even in prison, he was put over the other prisoners. And you probably remember how God gave him wisdom to interpret the dreams of the baker and the butler there in prison. They had been the baker to the, to, um, to the king and also um, the butler to him. And so they had these dreams And God gave Joseph the ability to interpret these dreams. In three days, the baker was hung. And in three days, the butler was restored to his position with Pharaoh. So Joseph asked the butler, he said, When you leave here, please remember me to Pharaoh, because I have done nothing to deserve being in prison. And I would say that the that the butler probably said, oh, sure, I'll remember you. We, we say things like that sometimes, then we forget, don't we? Well, the butler forgot. And two years later, Joseph was in that prison two more years before the butler finally remembered him. And the reason he did was because Pharaoh had a dream, and he knew it meant something, but he didn't know what. And nobody could tell him what the dream meant And it was bothering him. And that's when the butler realized that, oh, I never said anything about Joseph. So he told Pharaoh about Joseph interpreting their dreams and how they came to pass. So Joseph is brought out of prison. He's brought before Pharaoh. This is another amazing rise to power here by God's design. He he is brought before Pharaoh and he tells him, I can tell you what the dream means. There's going to be, there's going to be seven years of plenty. You're going to have plenty to eat. And then seven years of famine. He said, I've got a plan that you could, you could use. He said, just, you know, during the years of plenty, store up for the seven years of famine and you'll be able to have food for all of Egypt. The famine went beyond Egypt. And so Pharaoh said, well, who better than to implement that plan than you? So God used Joseph's difficult past to have him in Egypt for such a time as this. God also used Pharaoh to promote him to great power. He was second in command 
over all of Egypt. He was second only to Pharaoh himself. Well, when the famine years started, like I said, it went into the other countries too. And everybody started coming to Egypt because they heard that they had grain there that they could buy so that they wouldn't die of starvation. And that's when Joseph had to face his brothers again. Yes, the ones who sold him into slavery, who threatened to kill him, those same brothers. One day he looked up and there they were. And they were bowing before him and asking him for food. And I'm sure those dreams went through his mind. They're being fulfilled. They're bowing before me, asking me for food. Joseph knew he had their fate in his hands. He knew that. And he knew that he had the power to kill them. He just had to say the word and they would be killed and he wouldn't even be breaking a law. Nobody would blink an eye. But Joseph was still a godly man of integrity. His brothers were terrified when he finally told them who he was because I'm sure he looked very Egyptian by now. But Joseph recognized the purpose of God and that was more important to him than getting vengeance on his brothers. He understood God's hand in his life. He was there by divine appointment. So he showed mercy to his brothers. He didn't just feel sorry for them. He didn't just feel sorry for them and say, well, sorry, but here's a little bit of grain, go home. He showed them mercy. Mercy acts on the pity that is felt. Joseph's brothers had a need. They needed food. Joseph had more than adequate resources. He not only gave them food, he gave them forgiveness. Did they deserve forgiveness? No. Do we? No. But Joseph gave them forgiveness. He chose to meet their needs. He says, go back, bring our father, bring your families, bring your flocks. He said, I'll take care of you here. There's more years to this famine. So they came and he took care of them. But years later, when their father died, these brothers were afraid all over again. He's probably just waited till daddy died and now he's going to get vengeance on us. He's just been waiting for this time. So Joseph said it straight with these words. He said, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? He said, as for you, you meant evil against me. He didn't downplay what they did. He said, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. What God allows in our lives is for good, our good and the good of his seed. We just need to learn to trust him. Joseph saw the bigger picture. He wasn't caught up in what happened all those years ago. He was seeing what God was doing right here, right now. He had a choice. He could get vengeance or he could show mercy. But because he chose to show mercy, Joseph saved God's seed in the earth. Joseph was at the right place at the right time by God's design and he made the right choice. God knew he could trust Joseph with that position. Can he trust us? When we're mistreated, what do we do? Seek vengeance or bring healing? I know bringing healing is not always possible because sometimes the other person will not have it. But God says to to, um, bring that healing as much as depends on us. We do everything we can. If we love mercy, we're going to try to heal those circumstances. We're not going to add hurt to them. Showing mercy will often save the one who hurt us. Romans 12, 19 through 21 says this. This might be a hard, hard scripture to, to hear, but it's what God says. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Joseph fed his brothers. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If somebody hurts you and you retaliate by hurting them back, 
then you have become like them. <laughs> you're taking on their likeness and you're multiplying the seed that you hated when they did it to you. Seeds of evil rather than seeds of good. We need to learn how to bear an injustice without trying to get even with people or lording it over them. Well, you did so and so. We need to make sure that we're willing to forgive because if we don't forgive, Jesus said he won't forgive us. If we don't forgive others, their trespasses. If you're in a position to get revenge or to forgive and bring healing to a situation, always choose to heal rather than to injure. Because when we get vengeance, we're injuring. We're just bringing more injury to our injury. So God has forgiven us for so much. We need to forgive others. And I think sometimes in forgiving, we free ourselves for one thing. If we don't forgive, then we're holding that and we put ourselves in bondage by not forgiving others. And when we forgive others, it gives them a way out of their bondage. It gives them a way out of the guilt that they feel because they know they're really forgiven. It's like when Jesus forgives us, it sets us free. We're totally free from the forgiveness that Jesus gives us. And it's such a peace that we can have in Him. Let's give that peace to other people and forgive as He has forgiven us. Scott's going to share another song with us right now. Amen. Jesus did come to seek and to save those that were lost. And He is seeking and, and, and knocking on your heart's door we're all sinners, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be saved. We can be set free. And I praise God that no matter what I've done, He has forgiven me. If you ask Him into your heart, ask Him to come in and to save you, then He was faithful and just. He'll do that. He'll come in and He'll be your Lord and you can have joy forevermore. He has forgiven me. I know what it's like to think of things I've done And want to run and hide My head in shame And I know what it's like To really hurt someone And feel no sense of sorrow At their pain I know what it's like to have enough of my disgrace and find because of Jesus' blood my sin has been erased. He has forgiven me. My sin has been washed from his memory by the power of the blood of Calvary. He has forgiven me. Do you know what it's like for God to be your friend, to talk to Him with nothing in between? And do you know what it's like 
when the day comes to an end to sleep in peace because your heart is clean do you know what it's like when the accuser comes your way to look him squarely in the eye with confidence and say How good it is to know that we have been forgiven, that Jesus Christ has forgiven us from all of our sins. It is such a peace to know that. And if you don't have that peace tonight, that knowing that he's forgiven you for all your sins, you can have that peace. All you have to do is just confess your sin to him and say, Lord Jesus, please remove my sin. Amen. Come into my heart. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And your life will change totally and completely. Amen. Right? Praise God. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Our lives change beautifully when, when uh, Jesus comes in. We have got a lot of prayer requests here. This one is a praise report. And I, I want to read it. Um, a daughter had 16-hour labor pains with um, some complications, but God, <laughs> but God provided, and both newborn baby boy and mother are doing just fine. Amen. And Praise I am so happy to hear that. We have <clears throat> two little grand grandsons, and so little boys are just, they are just something special to us. I'm so thankful that God has worked in that one. And he'll work in all these others too. Amen. God works yes. with his people. Um, here's a family who needs prayer for several different issues. And um, here's someone who is praying for, for leading. It's a lady who is praying for leading. And God will lead God will lead if we, we just need to listen to him. And sometimes he will do it in a way that will just surprise you. So if you're praying for leading tonight, trust God. Trust him. And if it comes about a way that seems strange, that's just how God works sometimes. So um, we'll be praying too that you will get the leading and you'll know exactly what decision to make or, or whatever the leading is for. And also a motorcycle wreck. 
And um, so we need to pray here. It says for intervention here because of someone's had a motorcycle wreck. And also this person is trying to find a place to live. And if we, you know, if we ask of the Lord, he hears us. Amen. He hears us. And we're going to be asking of him. Here is a man who's in intensive care. And here's someone who is having colon issues and having a test done on Monday. And we'll just pray that, that these issues will be taken care of and that the test will come back clear and there'll be no more problems. We're going to ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I know you have some requests yes, too. Yes, um, there's a lady who has been having some nose problems. And she's asked for prayer. Um, Another um, lady's granddaughter who is quarantined for two weeks in Charlotte with this COVID-19. Um, a lady's been asked for praying for healing, uh, doctor's appointments. The list goes on and on. Pray, just ask for prayer and for blessings. Each one, God hears those prayers. God sees each one, and the Word of God tells us that He is touched by the feelings of our infirmities, no yeah. matter how small or how great they are. God That's loves true. us, and He wants to touch and heal each one of us tonight. I know people, um, sometimes they think it's kind of strange about praying for pets or something, but... Um, pets can really be, you know, get into our hearts Amen. like little people. And I know that your sister just yesterday lost her little dog. And, and it's, a, it's a pain, it's a sorrow, you know, that, that people have over their pets too. And um, God hears those prayers. God, God hears them. <clears throat> They're not too small for no. Him. And so if you will, it just um, pray. I don't know how much time we have, but if, if uh, because I wasn't watching, but if you'll just pray, we'll. Uh... All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just lay hands upon yes, these requests Father, now in the name of you. Jesus. Thank Lord, you your much. word tells us that you love us. You hear us when we pray. And God, that if you hear us, we have the petitions we desire of you tonight. And we ask you to bless, to touch, to heal, to restore and refresh and renew each one that's here, that's listed here tonight, God. You see each one and nothing passes by and nothing touches us without first touching you. Yes. And God, you are our healer, our redeemer, and I praise you for what yes. you're doing and going to do now. In the name of yes. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God does hear our prayers. And God hears your prayers too. He hears the prayers of sinners who repent. He hears the prayers of his people. And I'm so thankful that he does. Um, I hope that... I hope that the things that we have been talking about tonight and the teachings will help us to trust God more. Sometimes when I read these, these scriptures and everything, and I think, well, God was with them, and He says He'll be with us just exactly the way that He was with them. And so it gives, it encourages my heart, and I hope it does yours too, that we can be the people of God that He's called us to be, that we can have answers to our prayers too, that He'll put us at the right place at the right time by His design. We don't have to try to make things happen. We don't have to try to beg. We can just ask of our Heavenly Father, and He hears, and He loves you tonight. He loves you deeply. And what touches you, like Scott says, it touches the heart of God, too. And so we're going to be continuing on. We have another 30-minute segment, and we're going to continue on with um, in the vein that we've been going in because we've uh, studied. We're going to do justly, love mercy, but we've got walking humbly with our God. So we hope that you'll stay with us because we have more of Nightline coming up and it just wouldn't be the same without you. So I hope you'll stay tuned for the next segment.